per perfect podcast webinar. Ooh, Laura, this is so exciting. That is very exciting. I'm Sue Downey from nannypalooza.com, and this is Laura Brawley from nannybizreviews.com, and we um, are going to offer these short webinars on single topics that we hope you will find illuminating. And that's my big word for the day. The first <laughs> one that we'd like to do is to define or at least try to explain um, <laughs> developmentally appropriate practices. Um, what are they when you hear that? What does it mean? And why should we as nannies care about what this is? And if you have never heard of developmentally appropriate practices, I would urge you to do some reading in the early childhood ed um, sector of the world because they use that term all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, developmentally appropriate practices are a way of teaching, basically. And it comes from, um, it used to be that teachers taught from a curriculum basis, this is what you need to know. And th there was a thinking that, especially in early childhood ed, but it actually, um, there are, I think that it goes even higher, although I'm not 100% sure about that. But um, especially when you're talking about young children, that um, you want to approach things based on how the child learns and develops, which basically means um, that you don't want to try to teach Shakespeare to a two-year-old because they're not going to be able to understand that. What you want to do is formulate the things that you're trying to teach and expose to the child to their basic ages and stages as well as some other things that you're going to take into consideration. And um, this whole idea of using developmentally appropriate practices means that um, it's based a lot on research and what we know about a child's brain. So they're constantly kind of, not constantly, but often they're in flux and they change based on what we find out about things. Um, yeah, they're definitely updated pretty often. And NAEYC, I think, updates their official um, developmentally appropriate practice about every five years because as new research comes out and as we learn new things about the best way to teach kids and how they learn, these adapt and grow and change with that, which is one of the reasons I love them because it's a really easy way to stay up on all the research because who has time to read all that? So NAEYC takes all that information and sort of synthesizes it for you and puts it into these developmentally appropriate practices. So it's all based on the idea that the child that you're working with is an active participant in creating the learning experience. It's not just you pouring things into this sort of empty vessel, but that you are gauging what you're doing. I see a metaphor coming on. Oh, you're, <laughs> you're gauging what you're doing. It's, it's more of a two-way street. I can't think of the metaphor for that. <laughs> The empty vessel or... <laughs> yeah, it's not an empty vessel. It's that you're exchanging things back and forth, that you're basing your information off of what um, is going on with that child in that particular moment. And it's based on these that you have to keep in mind. Um, and I'm just... this You could, like, literally do this in a classroom for, like, six weeks to understand all of this. So I'm really kind of giving you just the little simplified overview. It's a um, snippet. It's a snippet, exactly. So that then you can understand as you read things um, kind of exactly where it's coming from. So um, the first consideration is that you as the teacher um, or the nanny have a working understanding of child development, which means you understand what the ages and stages are that you're dealing with. and. An example of that might be that you would understand that a two-year-old might not be able to comprehend um, an abstract term like tomorrow or what's another thing a two-year-old couldn't do or it's, give me another example of that. I'm well, if you're working with a two-year-old, you're going to understand that they can't follow four-part directions. You're going to know that's not appropriate for that age or that questioning authority is appropriate for that age group and you're going to do things to encourage independence and Right. And thinking outside the box and things like that. And you will also understand what experiences... So you're, you're, I'm sorry, but you're breaking up. I don't know if you're breaking up for everybody else, but for me, you're cutting in and out. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know why that is. We'll have to see. Is, I don't know. Okay. Um, 
so that also means that you have to know what experiences support the development of those ages and stages. For example, like what Laura just said, if you have a two-year-old who's questioning authority and asserting independence, you know what experiences to provide for that child to help them gain a sense of independence. So you might know, for example, that to set up um, problem-solving um, or not problem solving, to set up some activities that a child can complete on their own to increase their ability to be independent and um, know what to expect and what not to expect. So um, you have basically what you need to know is that you need to understand that typically developing children and or atypically developing children if you're working with special needs kids, um, what is what you can expect or not expect from them and what you can do or not do to help them with that. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. <laughs> Good. Okay. Am I still breaking up? I hope not. Nope. You seem to be fine now. Okay. Then you have to also understand what is appropriate for each individual child, which means, again, that Typical is sort of a broad term, and especially when you're dealing with kids, right? So, um, <laughs> so you understand that generally speaking, um, you know, five-year-olds don't bite anymore, generally speaking. But in your particular case, there might be certain things that are going on with this child that that might be um, something that's going, that's not even a good example, but you have to know the individual child that you're working with and you have to understand by observing and experiencing things with them what, not only what the typical development is, but where they are falling on that spectrum. Um, for example, this is a good example, my two-year-old that I'm dealing with right now, who's about two and a half, is a little behind the curve when it comes to um, physical risk-taking activities and because of that, her physical abilities like to jump off of things and certain climbing functions are a little bit delayed. Now it's not a developmental delay or anything like that, but I know my expectations for her are a little bit skewed based on the observing that I've done with her and the experiences that I've had with her. So then when I'm making choices for her as to what to offer her as for those gross motor activities, I know to to make allowances for her individual individuality. That's a good word. That is a good word. Um, also, you want to base things on a child's interests and abilities. Well, we just talked about abilities, but also their interests. So, yeah, I look at it as the ages and stages and the milestone thing. That's kind of the big picture. You have to know that where your child falls within the, that big picture, the framework, the house. And then you have to look at your kid. What does he like to do? What is his interest? And how does this particular child learn best? So even though you have the framework, every child's going to learn best. Some, just like adults, some are more verbal learners. Some love to read for early literacy. Some, you know, um, like to get their hands dirty. Some don't. So you have to know, again, the big picture of child development. But then you really have to look and observe and experience with that child to figure out how individually he's going to learn and what kind of environment is going to provide that for him. So that's how I look at it. See, that's a good way to say that. So then, exactly what you said. <laughs> but better. Um, <laughs> but then the next thing to take into account is the culture that this particular child is working with. And this does um, mean like the ethnicity culture. Like um, if you're working with a child who's recently perhaps adopted from Russia, the culture means that those children don't often get a lot of um, motor development in the young stages. So often, like, you'll run into kids who are adopted at 18 months who've been in a crib literally for 18 months of their life. So their cultural influences have an effect on them. But this also means um, what the particular family that you're working with, their values and expectations for that child. Is it important that the child has impeccable manners um, or is that not such a big thing? Is there a certain language that is acceptable in a family and not in others? The, if, for instance, and this seems silly, but it's so true, the word but <laughs> can be <laughs> bottom or bucket or, but, you know, and in some families there's real, like that's a real, family culture issue that you have to take into, into account. 
um, those kinds of things. And it also means the community um, that you're living in and the environment that you're living in. Um, so you have to take in, this is, to me, this is for a nanny, um, this usually comes very easily because we're in the family. It's not like we're in a classroom setting where we're having to sort of, um, you know, do this for 20 kids at once. Well, not 20, but 10. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, so you have to take that into account when you're, when you're working on it too. So those three considerations, then you put those together and you come up with these sort of, well, you don't come up with them, but they help you guide through this, the developmentally appropriate practices that you will use. Um, if you go to the NAE website, NAEYC website, there are principles that break this down even farther, like um, learning and development follow sequences, and that um, children develop best when they have secure relationships. So there's, there's, this is broken down even more into these sort of principles that um, they base all of this information on. Um, so if you want to do some more research on it. Um, what else do we need to say about developmentally appropriate Well, and I think it's it sounds very formal, the developmentally appropriate practices and, and all those other things, but really what it is is understanding how kids learn and grow uh, towards healthy development and then really creating an environment that helps them thrive, which is what nannies do naturally, but when you have the research and you understand, oh wow, say my, you know, my kid's having a hard time um, you know, coloring or, you know, cutting. Wow, what is the developmentally appropriate practice for that? So you can really, it, it helps guide you in, in creating the kind of environment you want to create, but it also guides you in your caregiving approach, your discipline approach, and how you pretty much take on everything in your role as a nanny as far as child care goes. So I think it's it sounds very formal, but I think a lot of it's already intuitive for nannies. But it also really provides um, just a lot more information. And it's one of those things that I think every person, every nanny should know because it's part of your job is to understand how kids learn, how kids learn best, and what you can do to support them in that development. And not, again, just not the big picture, but what you can do particularly for that child. So it sounds very formal, but it's actually stuff that can help you day to day in your work. And I think that it also can help you in a very tangible way when you are working with parents to um, a lot of these things you know, like Laura said, intuitively, but sometimes you're fighting against parents to, to push certain things. For example, um, one of the principles of, um, of child development is that um, play is an important vehicle for kids, that play is important and that that is, you know, a developmentally appropriate practices spell out all of these reasons why that play is important. And you can find lots of articles that support it on these websites that I have listed here. And so if you're having um, conversations with the parents about why, you know, there's so much free play in your day, this is a way that you can explain to parents, I do this because children learn best when it's play and here are the things, here are these articles and here are the reasons why I do this. Or if you're trying to sort of challenge your kids um, to move to the next level and parents are nervous that, you know, you're pushing or whatever, you can say, well, no, here, this is the reason that I'm doing it. So it provides the justification for the choices that you make every day and it does it in a way that's based on if we go back to the beginning, it's based on research and findings from the experts in the field. So that, um, that is very helpful when you're trying to educate parents on what you're doing and why you're doing them. Um, we, I think a lot of times as nannies, we all do things instinctively and we're usually right, not usually, but a lot of us are usually right, I guess. <laughs> and, but there are reasons why it works and knowing these, um, is the reason why. So that makes sense, right? Makes sense to me. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate you um, following along. If you'd like to listen to the podcast, check out the Practically Perfect podcast on iTunes. Um, it's 20, 25 minute conversation about all kinds of topics in the nanny care industry. Thanks for listening and we will see you soon.